Oh. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Sharp Designer Board Game Designer Sharp Tank. We're super excited to have everyone here, and uh, we have an awesome panel. Just a little bit about the Shark Tank. So we're gonna try not to be too mean. There's a lot of newer game designers here, but we have an awesome panel of publishers. The goal of this session is to give new designers a chance to you know, go after their dream of having all their awesome board game designs published. Not everyone has experience presenting to publishers. Some of the people that are gonna be presenting our experience, our first person, Carl Von Ostrand, who's online already here on the panel, has a lot of experience um, presenting games but not everyone does. So it's gonna be a mix of designers. I guarantee that all the publishers on the panel have a lot of personality. So there's gonna be plenty of personality on the panel. Some will be nice and some may not be nice. Uh, Rob Doherty, we have Rob Doherty. Hey. Just wave when I'm introducing you so people can put a face with the name Rob Doherty. He's the CEO of White Wizard Games, a designer of Star Realms, Hero Realms, Epic Card Game, a co-designer of the original Ascension, he is a Magic the Gathering Hall of Famer. He's run multiple board game companies, has tons of experience. Also used to run huge organized events for Wizards of the Coast. Uh, he's, I think he's gonna be nice. To <laughs> the, uh, we'll see, uh, we'll see. But um, so that's Rob. We have Rachel Blasky. She is a wife, mother, geek, nerd, pop culture enthusiast. She's a board game publisher with 524 Labs. Uh, she started out light and conflict free with her gaming, but she's gotten more strategic and competitive. She's always been competitive. I don't know what she's talking about. I think <laughs> making this up to sound like she used to be easygoing. She's going to probably be the toughest on the panel. Mm, we'll see. Action, check out, she's done a bunch of streams during Gen Con, so check out her streams. She loves making games. Um, they, they make small games. Um, Mint 10 games, which are really tiny cool. things. Definitely. And, and publishers, please, in the comments, feel free to post the link to anything you want to share, whether you have, you know, Kickstarter running or you want to share your social media links so that attendees can learn more about you. Uh, we have Carla here, who is uh, from Weird Draft Games. She also co owns Galactic Raptor Games. She is a crazy busy person. She Actually, she and Rachel are like the busiest people I know. They have so many projects going, like it's unbelievable. And I met Carla last year. She had a little get together for game designers at Gen Con, actually, hotel. And she carries around her her whole um, game design stuff. She's really awesome and always helping everyone out. She actually has, I think it's on Discord, but she can post the link in the comments where during quarantine, she's been sharing information and getting designers together to share information on how to be better game designers. So, you know, she's not only a publisher, but you know, she's also helping people become better game designers. She used to be a software engineer. We actually have a game that's gonna be shared today about computer hacking, which I'm pretty excited about because I used to be in the software industry as well. Um, and she was focused on robotics, but now she's putting that to use in game design and game publishing. And then we have Dominic from North Star Games. Uh, he, after 12, I, I'm learning stuff. I asked people to send me some information about their bios. And I'm like, after 12 seasons as an Alaskan fishing boat captain. <laughs> yes, I did not know this. Yeah. Very exciting. Because I don't know if you know, we have a fishing themed game that was submitted. That's oh. kind of yeah. uh, five years on the Magic Pro Tour. So we've got a couple Magic experts here with us today. Three years as a programmer, another nerd. I think we're all nerds. Mm. and um, also co-founded a game designer convention, Protospiel. Um, so Dominic threw everything away. Wow, that sounds very <laughs> cool. At North Star Games, maybe threw away all the money that he had, because we've all done that to start a game company. That's right. Um, well, that's what he means when he says threw everything away. I threw um, away my underwear, too. <laughs> he's I mean, the... Um, <laughs> He's also a game designer. I think it's really exciting that we have pe many people on the panel today who are publishers and designers. I think it gives them really good insight to help give advice to designers. Uh, he is lead designer at Oceans, Evolution, Say Anything. Um, he joins us. Oh, he also is proud papa of two rambunctious kids. Um, he also, yeah, he's with North Star, which 
they make super fun games, a wide range of games, and, and some of my absolute favorite games, which maybe I'll mention later on in the panel. But um, I'm super excited. Thank you, all of you, for joining. And um, I guess we'll move on to our first designer, um, Carl, who we have here with us today. Uh, we're going to have three. I need to set the timer here. We're going to set a timer for each designer for six minutes with the goal that it will be three minutes for the presentation, up to three minutes. And if someone takes less than three minutes, then they can have more time for their feedback. And I let the designers know this. So, you know, some people may present for less than three minutes. And if we naturally end in the six minutes, haven't gone up, we'll move on to the next person. But I expect that people, we're gonna have a lot to say. So, you know, we'll see how it goes. I've only done this once before. And it was in person, it was pretty impromptu at the Tabletop Network event, but I think it's, it's gonna be super fun. So Carl, um, so Carl's the first designer on the docket. He, um, well, some of the designers today haven't ever pitched their games before, which will be very interesting and I hope exciting for them. He has three published games, so he's pretty experienced. I thought he'd, he'd have to make him go first, put him on the hot seat. Um, he also, um, he's one of the designers of Kapow, which is a game that actually White Wizard Games we're going to be um, publishing later this year, which is a superhero, a dice game, which we loved. I met him at the Boston Festival of Indie Games. And uh, today he's going to be presenting a game about bards. You know, bards are underrated. A lot of people talk about what they want to yeah. be when they play D&D. Bards, you know, they bring the music, they bring a lot of fun stuff. And so, Carl, I'm going to hand off to you and let you tell us about Bardom, your game. Cool. Thank you. How's my audio? Am I coming through? Yeah, you're great. All right. Thanks, everybody. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to attempt to screen share now, too. So. <clears throat> Let me know. Let me know when that works. It yeah. works. Let me know. You want me to add it to the stream now? Yeah, yeah I think we're good. All right. Ooh. All right. So I'll, I'll kick it off. Thank you, everyone, for the time. This is exciting. I'm, I'm fun to go first here. So um, <laughs> today I'm going to be telling you all about Bardom. And as you can probably tell from your, your screen, I am doing a deep dive on the world of bards, as, as Debbie said. I think all their, their, uh, quite underappreciated, and uh, per that quote in the upper hand uh, corner here, uh, no longer will bards just be the ones making everyone else look good. It's, it's mm. time for them to be front and center stage, so to speak. And uh, you can see we have woodwind classes and variations on instruments. There's a lot of cool, fun instru instrument uh, mechanical tie-ins, uh, game terminology. So hopefully that starts to shine through. Uh, one, five, one to five player competitive and co-op solo modes and aiming for a 60 minute uh, game time. Switching over here. So what is the victory condition? You need to become the best virtuoso in the city of symphony. So that's a very prestigious title and you earn that by doing three things. First thing you have to do is develop your motif. And you do that through uh, exploring various locations and uh, using uh, and accomplishing certain challenges to develop your motif. You also have to make your melody, which is sort of a hidden information uh, resource uh, game that you have to actually find and develop your melody on the side. And then of course, you also have to uh, prove your worth in bard-based combat, uh, which is done by fighting off the creatures of silence that are invading the city. So those three things combined roll up into becoming the virtuoso. From a mechanism standpoint, you can see here uh, I'm using buildable dice here. I love buildable dice from an from a, uh, input standpoint, allowing players to actually control their role, determine their own probabilities. And then if you combine that with an output role of how, not just what you roll, but how you use it, you can keep a really fast cadence of game, uh, but also a lot of strategic waterfall of decisions that come by uh, deciding what you do with every role. So in this case, you're gonna use your dice to control your tempo, uh, adjust your volume, and uh, also pull off all the skill cards, which allow you to, to work towards those victory conditions. So that's one unique element of the game is you actually have buildable dice and character progression, and you can go to the, the training quarters and actually adjust your dice and make them stronger. Uh, lastly, I know I'm probably short on time here, the game map. This is one other interesting element of the game. You're gonna be exploring the city of Symphony. And it's gonna have some worker placement vibes, like you can visit Opus Hall and convert your music to gold. And that might help you work towards gaining a motif. Uh, but sometimes when you open up a tuck box and deal out the game at the setup, all of the locations can shift slightly. 
So they might be a little bit different. The resource conversion uh, equation might be slightly different. Maybe the Moody Bridge will be overrun with enemies and you need to actually fight them off before you can cross it. So there's elements of visiting locations for resource conversion, resource gain, uh, battling, and of course, fighting all the other bars that you're gonna be running into. Uh, so that's also one unique element of the game as you work towards becoming uh, the virtuoso. So in a nutshell, I think I'm probably out of time. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Are we doing on time, Debbie? Perfect. So everyone, so, oh, you're uh, doing great. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about how, uh, when I take my turn, I'm rolling dice and, and using and spending them on things? Is, it, uh, is that how it works? It is. It's, it's roll and assign, and you can assign um, the dice to adjust your tempo, which is basically your initiative in a lot of ways, or control your volume, which is how you might make a particular skill stronger, or you can actually assign them to your skill cards so that um, when you go, you can execute your skill. And are, is like fighting a skill? So if I, you know, you mentioned there might be like bad guys in the location that you need to clear before you can do something. Is that like you have a you assign it to a combat? Yeah, so some of the some of the skills are combat based. Some allow you to actually make music while you fight, right? So you can do both at the same time. Um, but yeah, some of the skills will basically be giving you things like combat music, or what I'm calling flourishes, which I think is a fun intertwined word of combat and music that are sort of a, like a mega attack. How based on music is it? Like, is there a lot of music theory or like none? Yeah, and I think that's something I'll be working on throughout the design. But a lot of the game terminology, obviously, like as many puns as I can work into it, into the city locations. <laughs> oh, I'm um, sold now, puns, got it, all right. Yeah, I mean, uh, you can go to the Vial Inn if you wanna get some cool quests, you know, that type of thing. But yeah, I, I'm, I'm a drummer, actually. My, my kid and I are both drummers. I love music. It's one of the reasons I thought this thing would be fun. And as much music theory as I can research and put in the game is going in the game. Well, this is a good direction. I'm curious if you've, uh, I'm, uh, have been into the Patrick Rothfuss uh, uh, books. And uh, it makes me think of Kvothe and the fact that he would always try and get patrons. And I'm curious if uh, that could be something that you could add into the game uh, uh, to as, as an additional objective, something to consider there. Um, the other thing um, I'm always wanting to hear in a pitch is what kind of components do you want me to uh, have manufactured Right. Yeah, I've learned this through some of my um, other games. So yeah, I was thinking about components from the get-go. And one reason I really like the card-based sort of worker placement where every location is a card is because we know cards are, are, are good for production while allowing a lot of content and modularity. So yes, the, I think the two main components to, to think about are there's going to be a fair amount of cards depending on how many scenarios would go in the main game. And then of course the buildable dice are, are a thing to consider. Um, other than that, it's a game board and some and some player boards. What's the player count? I don't. I didn't get. I, I'm looking for, it, but I don't see the, like the player count and the time. Yeah, it was on the it was on the very first screen. It was it's one to five players. Um, I I haven't gotten too deep into solo mode, frankly, um, but I'm definitely designing for co-op as well. And that that's again why I like that tuck box driven system. You can actually have like a ten tuck box campaign with a narrative built in, and the tuck box allows you to change that as it goes. You have different bosses and allow for more character progression. 60 minutes is my is my target time for a scenario. So we're out of time. Um, any final comments or thoughts, guys, before we move on to the next designer? I know we're everyone can be in touch with each other and I'll give you all contact information after the session. So if you're not able to give your feedback in the 60 seconds for the publishers, you'll you'll be able to reach people after the fact. But any quick any other quick comments before we move on? Dominic? For, for me, I think the biggest issue for me is it's hard for me to like latch onto the theme. And I know you're trying to do like a new theme, but for some reason, I just don't really get the bard. Like it's somehow maybe just the description, but I've never read anything with a bard. I've never played a bard. I just think of them as the guy with the leer, but I don't really, it's hard for me to get into it. And I don't think when you, at least with your pitch, there, you're working on a motif and a melody and without actually hearing music, it's hard for me to like get pumped with that theme. And maybe that's just because I'm in the minority and I just, that theme doesn't, like it didn't quite latch onto me like who you are and what you're doing and how you're doing it. 
Dominic, are you speaking from the perspective of a halfling berserker right now? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we're going to move I'm on. short, and I'm very angry. Excellent. <laughs> All right. I was excited about the bard theme just for the record, but you know, I yeah, sounds like maybe some other people too, because I also I do think as Carl was saying, bards are overrated. So we're gonna move on to the next game. But thank you, Carl, so thank much. Thank you, Carl. Okay. Man, I will pun I'll I'll support puns all day. Let's keep yeah. these puns coming. Okay, so let's see. Our next designer, Jeff Johnston. Jeff, hi Jeff. How are you? Jeff Johnston. Howdy, sharks. I'm doing pretty good. Wow. Give us the shark noises, everyone. <laughs> Jeff, <laughs> shark noises. Jeff joins us from Care of Jack Games. I actually met Jeff at the Granite Game Summit. I had, we don't usually bring our daughter to uh, our youngest to game convention. She's only five. But I noticed, oh, he was very popular with the young children at the Granite Game Summit. He does a lot of in a fun. In a good way. <laughs> in the best way. <laughs> Not in a creepy way, actually. Yeah, in a good way. I should mention that. Um, he's very active in the indie designer community in the Boston, New England area with the Game Makers Guild playtesting meetup and like the Boston Festival of Indie Games, which is an awesome local convention here for game designers. I highly recommend it. Um, he enjoys family focused themes like roasting marshmallows. Had a game he was showing mm -hmm. off called Toasted, which the kids were loving or roasted or young cubs tricking beers to hibernate and barely asleep. So today he's going to talk about a game about sandcastles. So I'll give it off to you, Jeff, to take it away. And All right. Thank you. You know, I heard sharks were here, so I immediately thought I'd grab my floaty and head off to the beach. You know, but with <laughs> sharks in the water, you know, when I went to the beach, the first thing I do is grab my sand pail, head to the edge of the water and start building a sandcastle. And if Debbie, could you switch over to my other camera? Absolutely. And that's the setting for this family focused game uh, for, for young young players, one to four, uh, excuse me, ages four and up, uh, one to five players called Sand Castle Hassle. And that's the setting uh, for, for this game, um, our beach right here. And sorry about that, folks. Um, so uh, what's the goal here? Well, we're trying to uh, build a, a sand castle. And what players are going to do is they're going to reach into a draw bag. You know, maybe it's this pail right here. And they're trying to find sand. Uh, because if we can find enough sand and fill our pails, we're going to be able to um, add more levels to our sandcastle, finish our sandcastle before the tide comes in and washes everything away. Now, how does that work? Well, a player's going to draw a uh, tile. And they're looking for sand. That's what they're looking for. And each tile has two sides. So, so this is a crab sand or a shell sand. And we see the beach here is kind of organized. We've got the shell column, the crab column, the, the sand dollar column. And so when I pick this, uh, now as a group, we're going to have to decide, do we want to add it to the, the pail there? Or do we want to start here in the crab? Because if we can fill up all the pails with three sands each, that's when we're going to be able to discard those and add that. So that's our goal. Um, but unfortunately, we might pull out of the thing a wave, right? And there are four of these wave tokens, one for each uh, of the rows. And if we pull out a wave, say we pulled out the crab wave, well, we'd have to play that right here. And what that's going to do is wash away all the sand in this pail. So we don't want that. And basically, I, I, this is a tower defense game at the beach. And, uh, you know, so, so the wave hits there. Um, so s what we might want to do is, is sometimes we'll pull out a sand that has a wall. And so instead of adding to the sand in our sandcastle, we might decide, well, let's use that as a wall. So now if this wave came along, it would wash away the wall, but leave our sand in place. So we're gonna have to balance that. And so what happens is the sand gets into the discard pile and we'll keep adding these waves and maybe we had it until we get to this wave, which is a wild wave. And we get to choose which column it goes into. And so let's say we put it into the the crab one, it'll wash away this crab. But once we have two waves in a column, that is what indicates, uh-oh, the tide is coming in. At that point, all of these waves plus everything in the discard will go into the, the draw and we'll keep going. So we've got a nice little thing there. And so what can happen is like, if you draw that one early, let's say we put that on the crab, maybe the next one you drew was the crab. Uh-oh, that ended the round right away. And we've done that, and so the players have left. So it's a fun little like, oh, I don't want the wave, and all kinds of that. Um, 
there's a nice flow, you know, just as a Sorry, ding, 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 and that ding. is that is sand castle castle. Oh, I do like the theme, but um, I'm not big in tower defense. Um, so okay, or, uh, yeah. you know. <laughs> you know, Carla, I'd already I'd already worked on your imprint for your young player game, the Wee Giraffes. That was we, a, we. A, yes. instead of weird giraffes, we giraffes. Okay, all right, that's adorable. So, I like fun. Uh, when, when Rachel, you're, Rachel, you're you're five five labs, but I'm gonna be quiet. Okay, and listen. Okay, uh, now, that would be your young imprint. Okay, it's on a mechanic. When you get a full bucket, you get three sand in there. You get to take all of one of those plastic pieces and build up your castle. Right. When if you get three sand in each of the pails, oh, each that's the, pail. the signal. Right. So if I've already got three sand in there, and I pull out a sand, say I had three sand in the in the shells and the in the starfish. If I pull up a tile that's shell and starfish, I uh, I I'll I'll just I'll have to dis I can't use it. I discard it and like uh oh now I've got to try to, you know, find, you know not avoid a wave again. And how many pick. do they need to collect to win before the before the tide comes up? How many times uh, do you need to do that? that yeah. Three yeah, so the, I've got it set up here six and six, but you could just as easily start the game at three and three. It's very scalable in that, depending on you so, know, what, what you want to do. Information you presented in that pitch, like that was a lot. I, I feel like I absorbed a lot of how to play in those three minutes. Um, it's it's uh, uh, obviously our company does more strategy games, so this doesn't isn't a great hit for me. But it's the kind of thing if I saw it on a shelf, I might want to buy it for my kid to play with them. Um, so. Uh, Even for the Wii Wizards uh, yeah. imprint? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, for this. I don't think you want the Wizards to Wii. No, yeah. no. <laughs> What's your age target? Uh, really, by putting the decisions right in front, four, up, four and up, right? Four. So they've really got that kind of like they pull the tile where do I want to do it? And then there's some nice layers of like, well, what's the consequence of doing that? That, you know, you know the, the older players can work with the younger players. I liked the clear thematic progression of the game, whereas uh, as you're going, you're flipping over a tile and it is actually showing the tide coming in, which is a really cool educational aspect for kids also. Um, and it kept it moving. I, I think that that is really cool. My adult daughter made me put in a tile called Litter. Uh, in the game, it makes you lose one of your walls, but it gives you a discussion point about, you know, uh, you know, in our environment, the ocean, keeping the beaches and the oceans clean. So that like seemed that. to be easy enough to do. I like I like the theme. I like the visuals. Yeah, I think for a kid's game, it's I love the co-op part. I love the theme. I, everything about it for like four plus. This seems like a really fun game to play. I'd say four to even seven or eight. It depends, you know, because a lot of times I have a seven and a nine year old will play games that are too complicated and they'll do it and have fun, but a lot of times they just want something simpler. You know, like let's play Uno now or Candyland. <laughs> right? Yeah, I, I'm not even on the panel, but I'd play it. Yeah, as, as my a parent, kids, I'd so. like to play this with my kids. <laughs> like a lot of, you know, like the, the, a lot of the games the kids want to play are hurt your, hurt you mentally to just sit there and sit through it, but this looks like it'd be fun to play with the kids and the cooperative element helps that. I do have a One, question. How, yes, how, uh, how integral are the actual sand castle pieces because I didn't. Oh, I mean, oh, perfect. Yeah. So that's just something I did kind of paired with the, like the, the, the pail is a thing, but like those cards that are sand uh, pails, you know, you could just as easily do those as cards. Um, you could have more fun, have them more whimsical. So you could have a very flat box. There's 27 tiles. There's six things that make the beach. There's the three pails. So you add another six, say things you could, you know, so the kids could have fun, you know, building this whimsical, crazy, never, not even possible sand castle. So you could cool. do that very, very cheaply. Yeah. Uh, uh, Dominic, your imprint is uh, North Star Games. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> no, no, we, need, okay. Not, we, need, we need to move on. So thank well, you. This so is a happy planet game for us. Thank, thank you, you Sharks. Much. It was fun swimming. <laughs> all right. We weren't sharky with him at all. Is this format, is this yeah. working for you guys? Yeah, yeah, Good. Awesome. Okay. If anyone in the comments has feedback on the format, you know, give us, we tried to make it long enough so people could actually cover what their game does and so that everyone could have a chance to throw in a comment, but we also wanted to get in as many designers as possible. So moving on to our next designer, oh. we have Maddie Schrader, uh, who I've met before. Hi, we've, we've played online. Hello. 
things together during quarantine, which is exciting. One of the, something new I've been doing during quarantine. Um, she's a hobbyist game designer from Springfield, Illinois. She's on the board of Geekway to the West, which I have not been to, but I would love to get to. That's a board game convention that hosts 3,000 gamers in St. Louis. I've heard awesome things about it. So you guys are doing awesome work with that. Um, she got into game design because she thought it would be awesome to have a game to play at that at their play and win event or see her game being played at the play. Well, I hope you do get to see your game being played there. And I'm looking forward to seeing your game today because it's a hacker theme game, which I'm from tech. I know some of others of us are very into tech. So it's called White Hat. So I will give it to you to go ahead and present to us. So I'm Maddie Schrader, and this is my prototype White Hat. White Hat is a two to six player action selection worker placement -y style game about hacking. And you are a team of hackers, and you assign your ta hackers to various tasks, such as writing code, selling code, trading secrets, building applications. The whole theme is based around being an ethical hacker and actually trying to patch vulnerabilities. And each uh, game, there are four vulnerabilities, A, B, C, and D that will have various goals that you have to accomplish. And you have to patch those vulnerabilities before everybody else. Each team has a uh, computer with a CPU that would snap into the CPU section and a memory stick, which would snap into a memory stick section. And you assign workers to various tasks. And the cool thing my game does is some of the tasks are tracks. And when you put a worker on the right code track, for instance, they can advance along that track in future rounds so they get better at those actions. It's uh, really interesting from a decision-making standpoint because you're trying to decide whether to keep your workers on the ha places they're already at or they are, is it better to change their mindset and switch to a new task? But if you do that, then when they switch back to writing code, they need to start back at the beginning of the track where they're not as efficient as those uh, actions. Mm -hmm. So um, the other cool mechanic of my game is there are graphics cards. And these are used for mining Bitcoin. Ooh. And Bitcoin is a cryptocurrency that you use to buy upgrades for your computer, hire new hackers, and uh, yeah, so it's kind of a medium heavy worker placement action section style game. Wow. Great. Uh, so I'm gonna pause the timer for one moment. Um, we had feedback from the audience that they'd like to hear whether or not you had published the game. So from the publishers, so mm -hmm. I'm not putting you on the spot. You don't have to say yes or no, not on this one in particular. It's just general feedback on the format. I guess, you know, what I would say, we have a lot of, quite a few newer designers that are going to be coming later in the stream. So I'd say um, if you are interested and you would consider publishing it, it'd be great if you could sh do a shout out. If there's things that would concern you about publishing a game, if you can mention what that would be and why it would be because one of the things that this is also good for is other designers watching and learning about like what they should include what they shouldn't include and they want to know why you're making a decision to cut to, to publish or not to publish or what what would knock out a game for you like if someone has a, i know in the last shark tank i was on someone had a lot of components and people were like yeah forget it i'm not making that many dice in a game so that kind of feedback super helpful not on that that's obviously not on this game specifically, but I just wanted to give that feedback before we jump into the um, feedback session. And the is the audience wanting yeah. us to uh, speak like as a publisher in general or a publisher that knows our own imprint that we would, would we have be able to print it or to make it for our company yeah. or in general, should this game be published? Yeah, I think it's, it would be fair to do both because, you know, we don't have representation, for example, of like ki a kid's, you know, children, young children's game company, for example, for the, the game we, we just saw for, well, no, you guys kids happy game. Planet, that, that game could fit in our Happy Planet line. Okay, ha okay. So, Don, so okay, maybe we cover every single type of game, but if, if I, I would like to see everyone speak to a game if, even if you wouldn't publish it, you can still give feedback on, I think this is a great game and someone should publish it. Or if I were making that kind of game, something that would concern me would be X, Y, Z. Cause we all play a lot of different types of games. Um, yeah. And, and obviously I'm not super familiar with everyone's every single game and everyone's lines. And I'll also mention that some publishers 
may not have a line, but they might be planning a line. So I've seen multiple situations where someone was talking with a publisher and just figured, oh, they would never make this game. And then they find out later, oh, that publisher now came out with an imprint where they do fun party games or that publisher is now making kids games and I didn't pitch my game to them. You should always be pitching your game because even if you're pitching, you know, a fun party game to me, we don't make fun party games at White Wizard Games. I mean, we make super fun games. Um, but, you know, I know Dominic or I know other people who might make that type of game. So always be pitching your game to all publishers and publishers, please give your feedback on all types of games. But if you wouldn't make the game, it's okay to give that as a disclaimer. So should we uh, should we talk about the the first two games uh, on, under those criteria? We're just going to do that going forward. What's your? Uh... Um, we could, yeah. I mean, I'm paused. So if Maddie doesn't mind, if you anyone wants to give any feedback to the first two games, um, so first we had Carl's game, Bardem. Yeah. So something I'd say real quick to to potential designers out there: um, uh, kids games and short games have an unfair advantage in the uh, in the pitch section. Um, so basically, if you tell me about your cool strategy, like game with all kinds, like with uh, uh, cards or worker placement or all those sorts of things, I can sort of get a general concept and, you know, maybe, oh, I'd, I'd like to try that. But I could never say, oh, yeah, that's that's ready to publish. That's an awesome idea. If your game is a kid's game or incredibly simple and has mechanics that, you know, you can sort of envision playing it just by hearing about it then I might get to the point where, oh yeah, that's, that, that, that game's a go. Like that's, uh, so, um, so it's very, very hard for me to hear about a game that has depth and say, oh yes, that's the, you know, that I, I want that game. I need to, I could get interested and be like, oh, I want to play that game and then decide whether, you know, that's, that's good to go. Um, so, that's uh, a good point. Yeah, so, that's, that's so maybe just, are you interested in hearing more yeah, that, later? So, would you yeah. be interested in hearing more so, if this would be a good? So thing? that said, I think I, I would uh, I would definitely be interested in hearing more and you know and uh, playing the uh, the bard game. I need to sort of wrap my brain around all the uh, all the mechanics and make sure that it had that sort of fun theme to play uh, interaction. But basically, I was intrigued, but that's as far as I can go on a game of that level uh, of uh, of depth. Um, and I thought uh, um, if I had a kid's brand, uh, I would be uh, I would be very interested in the uh, in the uh, the Sandcastle game. I would See, like us to uh, have a kid's brand. <laughs> I would I would I would buy it and play it with my kids. And anytime I feel that way about a game, or oh, I would buy that, then I'm I have some level of interest in. Mm -hmm. you know, it might not be for me, but yeah. So that's my quick on the first two. Uh, so me on the first two, um, I was also intrigued by the Bard game. Um, because it has the customizable dice, like it needs to be so much better than a game that wouldn't have customizable dice, just because like the cost would like mm -hmm. you have to have like a certain amount of fun for the cost, um, and the customizable dice increase that um, a bit. Um, but it, it sounded like it could be like a really, really cool game. Um, for the other one, um, it was too much of a kids game for me to um, be interested in for either. Mm -hmm companies all right uh so first one um uh standard cleric right here but uh i uh have <laughs> had some really really hilarious interactions with bards over the years and i think that people who really strongly identify with a character could really wrap into that um and uh there is always an audience so i think that that would be really cool to look more into like what you were saying rob to take a closer look at it um uh and then also uh with the sandcastle uh i absolutely was looking at that going um i need to show this to helena over at kids table board gaming or i need to show this to you know whiz kids are like hey look at this guys this is really cool it's not really my thing but this should be a game so uh yeah i guess that in those um, I mean, I'm supposed to be mean, but why are these so good? <laughs> Debbie, <laughs> and Maddie, oh my gosh, like this is so good. I mean, I'm we're looking like at from Finding Nemo, you know, we're like, nice. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, geez, I need to be more mean. I hope the rest suck. Okay. Uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, so um, I'm laughing to myself because I'm looking over in the comments and my husband is actually over there going, I love the idea of white hat. Somebody needs to pick this up. <laughs> and I'm like, mm, okay, all right, interesting. Um, uh, it doesn't fit in a tin, but it really needs to No, it does not. <laughs> Literally, I think it's way cool. I think it's a super interesting way to uh, get hacking into uh the eyes of of our audiences uh you guys cannot see what i can see and i'm looking at her uh her cell sheet over here and my eyes are bugging out a little bit because it says 550 cubes and mm -hmm. i want i want that addressed 550 cubes okay all right just um, before we move on uh Dominic, did you have anything you wanted to say about the first two games? I did. I, well, let me pause the timer again. I did start the timer for when Rachel was talking about White Hat, but just really quick. Oh, you oh you're you're muted. muted. It was um, Bardum. Well, we know you don't want like Bard themes, so. Well, I mean, the Bard theme just didn't work for me. Uh, I, I'm interested in like customizable dice. That's always kind of fun. Um, I just, I can't envision like, oh, my theme is getting better. Oh, my motif is better. I just, it's just not working for me. Like, as opposed to stats and I see that my character is, I can yeah. understand it better. Um, but that's, you know, I'm in the minority there. Um, the Sandcastle theme I thought was very good for a kid's game. I like the visuals. I like the waves coming up. I like the, the building of Sandcastle and the waves coming up. And we, I mean, it's just so relatable. Um, so yeah, for our happy planet line, this would be the type of game we'd be looking for. Okay, great. Okay, so Maddie, why do you have so many cubes? <laughs> All right, so uh, basically for the resources in the game, uh, there are code blocks and um, Bitcoin. There are application cubes for resources that the applications generate. Uh, there's just a lot of cubes. And that's mostly because I bought a set of just cubes and stuff for prototyping. And I was like, what can I make with these? What can I do with them? And that kind of is where White Hat came from. But it could easily be turned into cardboard shit tokens. It could be turned into a lot more uh, pu publisher-friendly components as well. So uh, full list, real quick on the components, what do you have? You've got the, you've got the cubes, what else? Uh, a bunch of cubes. We have the CPU tokens that I'm uh, going to move them in the camera. And we have graphics card tokens and memory stick tokens. And do you have like, then, player boards or. What's that? We have player boards or anything like that? Yes, each player has a player board with their actions and uh, six meeples per hacker team. And then there are uh, there's a dice placement mechanic for the uh, vulnerability board where you place dice on the board and you turn the dice for the pips. And those could be done um, really easily. And then the last mechanic are player screens that block off what actions you're taking. So during the planning phase, you people aren't spying on what you're doing. And that has all the iconography and stuff on the back of it. So. Yeah. It's two to six players. And how many dice come in it? Um, I forget the exact number, but it's 52. on the... 52 six-sided dice. Yeah, yeah, it's like six dice per... Or eight dice per player right now. So so basically, my, my big concern with this is this is going to be a pricey, pricey, pricey game. That I mean, that's okay. Some of the games that make the most money on Kickstarter or whatever are games that are like 100-something dollars or whatnot, but... Basically, with that component spread, keep in mind that's the category you're in, pricey game. Um, and uh, um, so that's not necessarily a deal breaker, but that is a caution point. Like if somebody's like, oh, I want to, you know, get a game from like a 20 to $40 price point or whatever, this probably ain't going to be that because it's, you know, a lot, a lot of components. Mm -hmm. It's like I said for the other, um, the Bard game, like for the expense, you have to have like so much fun to justify it. Um, what I would do instead is like figure out like, do you need that many cubes? Do you need that many dice? Can you mm -hmm. share the dice? Like, can everyone, like if are people rolling dice all at the same time? 
uh, or the, can you do it where like one person rolls a dice, whatever, so you can have like a shared pool and you can cut the cost of that. Like, and if you could do something like if you roll a die and you need to place it, you could then take a token or something and not yeah. place it. I have a place a token. I don't know if that would work for your game, but you know, cost cutters. It really would, honestly. Um, right before the uh, pandemic started, I was play testing how many components I could remove because it was just a pile of cubes and stuff that we could play yeah. with. And I've been trying to figure out how many do I actually need in the game. And I've already pared down quite a bit and I'm still working on that. Yeah, I would say that would be your first step to, so like people don't, like a publisher doesn't look at your sell sheet and go like, whoa, I don't even want to deal with this. Cause like when I see uh, sell sheets where they have like way too many components, what that tells me is that like the designer doesn't know like how publishing or maybe how the design world works. Mm -hmm. um, and they, they haven't done like, it'll take a lot of effort to get that a lot down into something that's publishable. I mean, when we're thinking about this, we're thinking about, okay, how many are we going to, like, you've got the manufacturing piece, then how heavy is it going to be to ship? Then, I mean, on and on and on. I mean, it, it's it's all considerations that the designers maybe aren't thinking of because you're too busy making an amazing game, but then we have to pare down and uh, make it all practical. Understandable. We're out of time, but any last comment, final comments from any of the publishers? It sounds like I, I think that was really good feedback. Yeah, this is another game that I'd want to I'd want to play because obviously there's a lot of meat on the on the bone there of like a lot of you know a lot going on. So I have to. It sounds fun. I need to sit down and play it. And then there's the question of with all those components, is this something where okay, this should be marketed as a super expensive game, or does it really need to get those components trimmed down? Yeah, Dead I would agree. Like, it sounds great. If, if it fit in this, I'd be all in. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you, Maddie. Thank, thank you so much. It means a lot. Okay. Add the next person on. Designer is a husband and wife team. Ah. Hi, Scott and Kara. Hi. Kara Reynolds. Um, they are from the Columbus, Ohio area, which we know there's a lot of gamers out there. Um, for the area where the Origins Convention is headquartered. They have three kids. Uh, Scott's an electrical mechanical engineer and Kara's a stay-at-home wife with their mom with the three kids. Uh, Azul was the game that got them really into gaming and uh, obsessive about modern board games. They also love Sagrada, Carcassonne. They listed so many, I'm not going <laughs> to spam when they sent me information. I was like, um, and they're going to present their first game, Pier 13 because they had trouble finding a game about fishing. Um, and so they designed one. So I will hand it off to you, both of you, to present to us. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, I'm Scott, and this is my wife, Kara. And uh, we're going to go ahead and switch over to the board game uh, view while we uh, tell you about it. All right. OK, this is our game, Pier 15. It's a competitive fishing game for two to five players over a 20 to 50 minute time period. It's a highly replayable game with strategic gameplay and unexpected outcomes. You win by weighing your catches after a 10 day fishing trip. And to start the game, each player rolls the dice obtaining bait and coins. Each player then uses up to three out of four actions available. These actions include moving along the pier to different fishing locations, buying equipment or bait at the bait shop, picking an event cart, and going fishing. Even on the first day, you will have enough power and bait to go fishing. The goal is to power up by buying equipment. You can buy three levels of upgraded equipment at the bait shop, including rods, lines, reels, and lures. For more equipment and power you have, the bigger fish you can catch, which in turn, the more weight you will have for a win. The prize tokens under each fish you catch adds a surprise element where you can fish up extra coins, bait, and actions. The pick a card action allows you to pick an event card that may have bait coins, bait shop privileges and discounts, power-ups, broken lines, lightning strikes, fishing nets, contests, and the ever so sought after shark. We haven't seen any other game like ours. Our fishing game was designed to be easy to learn but still requires some strategy. It was meant to be colorful with uh, and full of art. It is resource driven with dice and card play, and it is fun to catch your favorite fish, collect prizes, and attack fellow opponents. Pair 13 brings your family together for a fun, stress-free night of fishing in the comfort of your home. 
We are a family of five and we are always looking for games with five players in a wide age range that all of us can play and have fun together. We really enjoy sabotaging each other and everyone wants to catch the elusive shark. We encourage you to take a look at our Instagram page for more info and gameplay. It's called Pier 13 Fishing and you can find that name at the bottom of your shell, cell sheet. Thank you. Uh, are there take that elements? You mentioned sabotage at the end. Yes. Yeah. We have a uh, couple cards that we play through the event system um, you can pick up. So uh, on the game board, there are fishing spots that sometimes only one player can be in. The only way to get them out is if they decide to leave to go back to the bait shop. Or we have a lightning strike card, which you can use to basically boot somebody from their spot. Um, this would come into play if, if uh, there's like a higher level fish and they're and somebody's basically camping that spot, there is a way to get them out so you can move in to try to get that fish for the for the weight. And then like the broken line you can get and play against another opponent anytime where when they go to fish, you're gonna break their line, they won't get the fish that turn. And sometimes when they have cards sitting next to their player board, you're like always nervous that they're gonna break your line or they have that broken line or the lightning strike. So it's fun. Well, I uh, am really interested in hearing what Dominic has to say. <laughs> like Dominic's made also the most beautiful game with fishes out there as well. I mean, he's got oceans and he was an Alaskan beautiful. fishing boat. Yeah, yeah. go. Where's the boat? Where's the bar? Where's the waves? <laughs> right there, use your imagination. <laughs> The boat, the boat can be the expansion. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> the expansion, I like it. Uh, so you mentioned, like, how do the dice come into play? Uh, so we have two dice. Uh, this is basically the the resource. You're basically rolling this every turn, and based on what you roll, you can get coins and bait. Um, two sides of each dice have two of each, so you can get up to two coins and two bait at the beginning of your turn. Um, and that's how you start building your resource. Oh, those dice again. Sorry, I wasn't right. zooming in on you. Yeah. And then we have, so some sides have uh, the double. So we always like to say we roll the double double uh, if you end up rolling both of the doubles. Um, that's the, the start of how you get your bait. You also get bait after fishing. Sometimes the tokens will have extra bait. Um, you can also buy bait while you're at the bait shop if you're having trouble getting enough to get the bigger fish. Because like, uh, like if the shark does come out, the shark is an event. It's not always out. It's the biggest, most powerful uh, fish in the game. Uh, you need all of your bait to be able to catch that. So you, if you want to go after it, you have to think uh, wisely about how you fish because if you just keep fishing really big fish, you're gonna run out of bait a lot. So so you basically, you get resources, you buy, you take your piece and you go to the bait shop, you buy the you buy the materials to fish with, then you take your counter and you, you go to a specific fishing location. Some of them can have more than one player, some of them can only have one, and you're collecting the fish and trying to get the maximum fish weight. Do I have the, the overall uh, uh, mechanics there? Right, yes. yes. And, um, uh, um, how you said you play with your kids? How what, what's your kids' age ranges again? Uh, we have a five, nine, and he's about to be thirteen. Uh, the five-year-old does play with us. He does. He needs help because you know he can't. Sure. Read, but he does. You know he always makes the fishing action. He loves the fishing part. Um, when we played with the eight, nine-year-old, he uh, was right into it. He likes. He's probably our biggest board gamer kid. So he got right in. Didn't have any trouble picking it up. And. Uh, the older one, we have to kind of force him to play with us, but he he had fun when he did. So. Sure. So basically, like the 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 nine is sort of the sweet spot age, and you can sort of catch it. And how about how about for the uh, for the parents? Would you would you consider this like a like a kids game that adults play with the kids? As uh, an I I kind of feel like it's more uh, it's more adult. I, we were hoping for a more adult. We're, we're okay. adult, more okay. adult, yeah. adult game that can, that can go down to that age range. Yes. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. okay. Great. So we're out of time. Any final comments by any of the publishers that you want to add? Um, I don't think it would be a good fit for me, but just based on the randomness of both the dice and what fish there are, it's probably like too much randomness for the amount of strategy that my lines do, but like that's fine for family weight games. 
Okay. Yeah, I think we, we brought this up earlier. For a game of this money, resources and stuff, you, you kind of have to play to see if it reaches this kind of interesting balance. It's hard to get it. You yeah. know, right now what I have is a theme and an age group and a, and a length of the game. Um, the theme, I think, is relatable to lots of people, which is good. I personally don't like, I know I was a fisherman, but I don't like fishing with the reel because I don't like the hooks going in their mouth and the blood, you can take it out. So, <laughs> so you're probably swimming upstream with me just just because of that. Um, and my daughter would cry. Yeah. Like literally she would just cry when we talked, but she was like, she would just not want to do that and pull the, the, the needle up. So there's that hurdle with my experiences with my daughter who's very attached to animals. But there's so many people who are into fishing that I think you'd have an audience. Yeah, yeah I think so. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's what I think. It's very relatable. I just, for me personally, it's harder pitch for me just because of, just because of that. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you guys. Thanks, thank you guys. Scott and Kara. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. All right. Next up, we have a design team for Texas. Let's get added. Tessa, hey, hello. Hey um, so for Tessa, I had the opportunity when I was on this panel at Tabletop Network, for Tessa was brave enough to just spontaneously come up and present her game, Book of Villainy, which is already signed, so we're not going to be seeing that today. Um, so I asked her if she would come and present here because I knew she had another game that she was pitching around. Um, so uh, for Tessa is a game designer. She's signed two games. Uh, Book of Villainy with Gold Seal Games. Oh, and Wicked and Wise with Weird Giraffe Games with Carla. Uh, also writer for Girls Game Shelf, which per, that, that that's an awesome group. If we, if you don't follow their content, you should check it out. And again, feel free anyone to post your links below during the stream if there's things that you want to promote that are related to these games or the um, publishers or designers. Mondo Davis is a designer from St. Louis. Uh, his debut game, Color Field, is coming out in 2021 with century 25th century games he is a prolific mansplainer um which is why he's a great co-designer for this game that they're going to present today which i was super excited about i found it really intri intriguing called mansplaining he also enjoys baseball and tending to his big tree at home in atlanta so i will give you guys let you guys take it away and mansplain away to us Right. All, right. All right. So I'm Fratessa Lees and this is Mondo Davis. And today we are pitching mansplaining. What's mansplaining? I'll tell you. So <laughs> mansplaining, <laughs> is, <I'm not> <laughs> mansplaining is a party game that plays three people and up, ages 10 and up, and it can play from 10 to 30 minutes. So in this game, the world is in need of a leader and it's up to you to tell people how to do things and how to do them well. You, as the mansplainer, will have 60 seconds to tell people how to do insert topic. And you will also have four words, detailed words to spice it up. They could be at random, charcuterie, aardvark, whatever. It's going to spice it up. After those 60 seconds, your audience has to guess what topic you're explaining, as well as what detailed words you tried to slip in. Mondo, take it away. Yeah, so just to uh, kind of show how it works, I'm just going to do uh, a little round here, 60 seconds. I'm going to mansplain a topic, um, and I'm going to include four detail words that are actually in the game, and uh, y'all can take a shot at guessing both what the topic was and um, what those detail words were. So here we go, 60 seconds. Uh, so, well, actually, this is a bit of a lost art, um, you know, Especially now it's hard because it's hard to get outside. It's hard to go and be with people, friends and family, but it's good to go and take all your food and take your, um, you know, take a blanket and go to some open space. Uh, you got to coordinate with your friends. You got to be on time. You got to be punctual. That's very important. Um, but you go there, you put down your blanket, you uh, pull out your food. Maybe that's like fruit and vegetables. If it's, you know, apples, bananas, cranberries, oranges, figs, whatever. <laughs> Um, and you set it up and you get ready to eat and then it's time to eat and you but before you do that You gotta go look around and make sure there's no signs or announcements or placards saying that you can't be there um, Now sometimes this may feel a little childish. Maybe people aren't you know sure about doing something that's that's kind of for kids uh, But in reality as adults, it's fun. It's fun to do it with friends and family and uh, you know I highly encourage that you get out there and try to do this. It's, it's really worth your time 
So that would be that would be the uh, a mansplanation from the game. So then players are listening to that and um, would have uh, some time to first again guess, guess the topic, which they'd all do at the same time. And then after that, after those guesses um, are made, then they would get four guesses at the at the detail words that were s slipped in. Um, so then, as far as scoring goes, if you guys want to think about your guesses, I think you can go ahead and take some guesses because uh, that's the fun of the game. But as far as scoring goes, uh, the mansplainer gets. Uh, points if a certain number of players guess their topic correctly, um, kind of a, a, a Dixit, Dixit scoring style. almost, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then um, the, that the mansplainer will get one point for each word that they use from the detail cards, and then uh, guessing players will get a point if they guess any of the detail uh, words correctly. So it, again, it plays um, you know 60 second rounds. Players. I'll take turns and uh, add up your score as you go. And then by the time everybody has mansplained, uh, play with the most points wins. So do y'all have any guesses about what the topic was? Picnicking. Picnic. Mm -hmm. All right. That's correct. I felt <laughs> very informed on how I should. Yeah. <laughs> how about the detail well. words? <laughs> and we <laughs> start everything with, well, actually, and end with some form of, do you understand? <laughs> I'm so in. <laughs> yeah, I love everything about this. Yes. So, uh, right. I'm um, here to get words. Announcement, childish, punctual. Uh, well, any other guesses before we say what they were? Uh, placard. Placard, yeah. <laughs> Oh, what was the other figs or something weird? That you oh, said? It has a fig tree, so I don't think the fig was a real bird. <laughs> I don't know. I thought that, but then I was like, wait, he has a fig tree. So <laughs> the brain. Brain. No, yeah, it was placard, cranberry, uh, childish, and yeah. punctual. Oh. All right, we well, did good. There you go. You guys did it. And now I know how to picnic. <laughs> well, earlier that we White Wizard Games doesn't doesn't publish um, party games right now, but I love party games, and this sounds super fun to me. Oh, I'm buying it whenever it comes out. <laughs> somebody's taking that. I, I would like to make party games, but anyways, so I'll let. Rob Quick question: uh, um, <laughs> Would you plan on people taking uh, taking notes? I was finding one thing that was hard for me is like remembering all the weird words that were coming up. So like, yeah, I'd love to be able like. Scribble down where words that they say. So um, for Tessa showing a little card. Yeah. Oh, I think, okay. Yeah. Cool. Mm -hmm. so she's, she's holding up the scorecard. So each player has one of these in a pencil um, so they can keep their score on top and then also can kind of take notes or write down their topic and detailed guesses so they can all be revealed at the same time. And as a, as a man's player, my goal will be to put in it all, all my weird words but not have people guess them because I'll mm -hmm. get the point for putting them in and I'd like them not to get points for guessing yep. them. So yep. Yeah. All you want them to guess is your topic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, no, I, I, I would definitely, uh, um, you know, if someone was like, hey, you know, we're, you know, we, we've got a bunch of games and they were describing ones like this one, I'd be like, oh yeah, let's let's try that. So <laughs> definitely falling in the I want to, you know, I want to play category again. You know, it's uh, currently not a type of game that we publish, but um, but if we, you know, if we were if I was going into that zone, that would be, you know, this seems like it'd be a super fun uh, uh, game. I'd have to, you know, I'd have to play it more, but I don't think I'd have to play it much because hearing that description and watching yeah. one round seems to, you know, mm -hmm. make most of it. Yeah, this was a great pitch for this sort of game because, like, I understand how to play because we played around. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nice. Any yeah. other comments? Oh. Well, just the pitch is great. I mean, the, the name and the way you go about it i mean it's just timely and funny it's just the the name itself is just a hook you know right yeah. great man i mean i would pitch that to sherry spiro at breaking games like bam go now <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're, we're we're fine. sorry mondo what were you gonna say i think i think we i think we emailed uh breaking games as far, with a pitch but yeah <laughs> we'll cool. Awesome. Okay. Well, thank you. I also thought that was fun. So, Rob, we need to make party games now. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Add to your everyone for this game. All right. Thank you so much um, for joining. And also, it was fun that we got to play actually play around. I am going to move on to the next designer. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Real quick, for other designers out there, things like great. that where you can, if you can, play around with your game in the thing. Like not every game does that, but if you can, mm -hmm. it's really great. And great job working, Evan, guys. 
Yeah. All right, let's see our next. All right, our next designer is Joshua Bryan. And he's gonna be presenting a camping themed game, which is very timely. A lot of people are camping. We're camping just in our backyard because we don't go anywhere right now. Literally, we have a tent out there right now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> he's called Crimson Woods. Um, he's been working on it for over three years. He has three great kids and eight fur babies. Eight, wow. Um, been married for 15 years and is currently studying cybersecurity. This is his first fully designed game, but he has many more that are gonna come. They're just still up here right now. So Joshua, we'd love to hear about it. All right, um, so if I can, I was gonna do a share screen so I could show you guys some sure. images. Okay. So far, we were doing pretty good on the technical, getting people up. Oh, knock on wood. And switching people. <laughs> Don't say that out loud, Dennis. My first time doing a large panel like this. Uh, hopefully, right. okay. So yes, it, it, it's definitely um, it's definitely camping theme, but in the sense okay. of we are all counselors at Camp Crimson Woods. Uh, so what you guys are going to be doing, this is just a little mock up of the box art and the different tiles that the couple tiles and the resource mm -hmm. cards. With uh, you'll be actually forming a thirty six grid uh, map. All the ones that you see that have the camp logo oh, on them are actually Just pause for one minute. We don't see your screen share. Yeah. Can you try clicking share screen again? Oh, okay. Um, oh, that might be why. Sorry, didn't want to kill your flow, but I got to see what you're saying. Yeah, I thought I added you, but then I realized, oh, no, that wasn't you. So I <sighs> we have some other people backstage. <laughs> we pause your timer. Okay. Uh, no, that's not it. Where is the... Debbie, you said that we weren't going to have... <laughs> it's all my fault. Know, so just below yeah. where you see yourself, there's yeah. little icons and share screen is one of them. At least that's my view. Um, so if you click on that, you should be able to share your screen. Oh, there we go. Okay. Do you, okay. So you're seeing uh, an ID card right now? Oops, sorry. Uh, yes. Now, yes. Yes, we see it now. Great. Okay. And uh, so if I go, you guys see the box art and some cards on the right-hand side? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. All right. So, yeah, Crimson Woods, uh, it is a camping game in the sense that we're all camp counselors at Camp Crimson Woods. Uh, there is a maniac killer on the loose. We woke up in the middle of the night to a blood-curdling scream, and now he is hunting all of us down. Uh, we are trying to travel through this 36 grid map right here uh the four main tiles in the middle is the starting area those are always going to be face up and while you're traveling throughout the other 36 tiles or the other 32 tiles you're going to be flipping them over after your eyes have been adjusted to the darkness and you're going to have certain things that you'll have to resolve like safely crossing a stream or digging through a cabin trying to find a weapon that you could use to actually fight the killer off with uh, then hopefully you'll be able to discover either the car, the boat, or the watchtower tile. And along your journeys, safely been able to discover one of the 32 mini card tokens that will have the keys for that. And then be able to escape by getting away from the killer on off the map. Uh, this is a semi-cooperative game in the sense that if two, it plays two to six players. If two of those counselors happen to find the car and have the keys and also the gas that you would need to use to get away, then that car tile will be removed from the game. Those two play people will successfully win, and the other four are going to have to search the rest of the camp for the two other ways to, to escape. Uh, this does have player elimination. I know a lot of people don't necessarily like that, uh, but this game's theme is heavy on the player elimination, so that's mainly the reason why and that's pretty much crimson woods so um uh on your can give me a feel of what what my turn would be like so it's my turn what do i do all right so on the beginning of your turn you're going to actually move you have a base movement i, I didn't go over that with the i with the id i'm sorry i forgot about that Okay. Uh, you, each, you each have a base movement and you each have a base hand size and the base movement you'll move that many tiles away 
once you leave the tile that you were on, that tile is going to get flipped face back down. So there is a memory mechanic. Hopefully you'll remember where certain tiles, good or bad, are. And then you'll go on to the next tile that you go to, flip it over, resolve that tile, and then you would be able – then you your turn would end and it would go on to the next player. And how do I die? The, there will be encounters uh, where you encounter the actual killer. Uh, the killer is actually controlled by a coordinates mechanism. There are two different dice, a uh, column and a row, which is why it's the 36 tile grid, where when those are rolled, he'll show up on different tiles and he could potentially show up on your tile, which has the regular coordinates for the grid board, as well as coordinates on the bottom right hand corner. So there's multiple ways he could appear. And if he appears, you'll have to battle him. It's a dice random roll-off system where since he's the killer, he's more powerful. He gets three dice. You get two dice, but you also get modifiers if you find like the axe or the other weapons that are in the game. Hmm. Anyone else have any questions, comments, feedback? I'm still trying to wrap my head around what do we do with the people who get kicked out early and like how does that affect the overall experience? I, I mean, so yes, elimination is a it is a controversial part and it's obviously something you're well aware of so how are you handling that so there's been a couple different things that i've done through playtesting. number one the killer is controlled by the game itself so a lot of things that we've done is if someone has been eliminated that the person kind of takes over for the killer rolling his three dice mm -hmm. um uh kind of like rolling the location dice so they'll go ahead and move him to where he needs to go and whatnot. The other thing is is a lot of times during gameplay when I've found that it ends up with the person dying it usually doesn't happen till like towards the end of the game and actually when one person starts dying they all start dying. So it's usually a domino effect of once he's kind of got them down low enough it ends up where he's just taking them all out at the end. And the other option I did kind of toss around was kind of like a respawn effect where you could just respawn back in the bunk as a new counselor that somehow was sleeping through that first. Yeah. I like that. <laughs> and then uh, he's like, hey, what's going on? <laughs> that would be me. Yeah. <laughs> I think the the mystery is intriguing. I like the idea of uh, the grid system. I think that that is really interesting and uh, gives some concrete uh, some concrete instructions for how to how to run the game. Um, I would need to see more before I would consider myself in. Yeah, I think my biggest question is uh, from from the pitch is okay, is this like a memory game? Am I sort of moving, okay, I roll the dice and I can move to a location. Am I picking a location randomly? Is there information that's helping me make decisions or is it primarily a memory game where I'm like trying to match things up? Like what, um, you know, that's, uh, you know, that's the thing that I'm, I'm trying to latch onto right. uh, you know, from the pitch of like, what am I, what am I doing? What kind of, style play am i you know am i uh am i solving a mystery am i am i remembering things what am i how what's my play experience it's a uh, more I, I believe it's more exploration because you're trying to find one of those three tiles out of the 32 that is the car the boat or the watchtower to believe to be able to escape uh with the watchtower you would call the cops and the car and the boat you can just get out of dodge um <laughs> with the uh, the memory aspect, I just had it's just there, not as like matching up anything like your typical memory. It's just like there's a tile that is the killer's hideout. You and your group of other counselors are going to want to hope that you don't don't end up accidentally going over to the killer hideout again because it's a bad it's just a bad tile all around. Yeah. Uh, and then also, if you find the car and you don't have the gas or the keys, you're going to hope that you can remember it where it is so that you can actually get out. So, so this is not a co-op, right? I'm sorry, say that again? This is not co-op. It's I, I call it semi-co-op because everybody's kind of trying to escape. Uh, everybody wants to get out, get away from the killer, but you can leave people behind. 
how do you win? It, do you win if you get to the car with the gas and keys? Uh, there's a roll off mechanism where there's a chance that the killer could pop up or you stall the car out or you do successfully leave with a one uh, six sided die. So it's a one player wins. Uh, I guess essentially, they yeah, roll. they roll off. Yeah. Because Either everyone loses and dies or one player wins. Well, if, if there's more than one person on the tile, they all escape and you all win. Okay. So we're out of time. We're actually over time. If you guys have right. any really quick comments, throw them out there. Otherwise, we'll get, we need to move on. Uh, I think uh, there's a disconnect for me. Like, if it was like pure co op, like you want to get as many people out as possible and you can win that way, it would be more appealing versus just try to get out and you don't care about everyone else. Um, <laughs> I mean, I'm totally, if there's there's a killer following me uh, and I'm running with somebody, I'll trip them so that they, that I get away and they get them. But I, I mean, really, <laughs> I I feel like there seems there seems to be some more work to be done before before I would take a really good look at it. I need better answers for my questions. Okay. Okay. It feels very random to me, which is just something I probably wouldn't publish just for my market. Okay. Right, thank, thank, you. thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Josh. You. Thanks very much. All right, so our next, so I guess just before we move on to the next, so I, it seemed like general feedback on that session was make sure you're explaining how you win, how you lose. Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, that's a pretty important part of a yeah. pitch. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, and why is the game fun, you know? Like Rob is trying to bring it up. I trying to like why? Where's the fun element in it? Um, yeah. Yeah. What am I doing, and how am I having fun? That's that's what I want to. I wanted to play understand. the killer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I like his idea of oh, be the after you're eliminated, be the killer. You know, like contribute. But I yeah. want instead of just controlling the being the person who rolled the randomness, I want to be able to steer the yes. killer a little bit to kill everybody else off because I'm dead. I want them dead too. So yeah. right, totally. <laughs> It, it felt very random to me. I couldn't quite get like the strategy other than the memory part, which is, isn't is something that I really enjoy. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Okay, great guys. So the next um, team of designers, which I was really excited about when they um, contacted me, Sun Team, Hi. which I was about. Uh, it's oh. Darlene Finney and Ethan Watkins. Um, they're both graphic designers. Ethan's working on his bachelor's degree in fine arts. Uh, they love to play games. They started designing games about a year ago. And this is their first pitch ever, so go easy on them. <laughs> um, and the theme, I actually really love the theme. It's potatoes. So uh, <laughs> uh, thanks for having us. Uh, I'm Ethan. And I'm Darlene. And uh, we're Rogue Fox Games. Today we're showing our game, uh, Super Hot Potato. Uh, this is a two to 20 player frantic fun party game for ages 10 and up. The idea is that we are here to help a crazed uh, potato named Bud the Spud get where he needs to go. Really though, you're just trying to get Bud as far away from you as fast as you can. After all, with his self potato powered oven baking device, he will make himself and anyone unlucky enough to be around him into some instant mashed potatoes. So make sure you tell him where to go as fast as possible before he finally blows. To play, all players who come into possession of Bud at the end of the potatoes movement will draw a movement card and read the entire card as quickly as possible. They will then perform the action on the card by passing the potato from player to player until he reaches his set destination. When the timer finally goes off, the player in possession of Bud is out, and a new game with the remaining players begins. As the amount of players goes down, the amount of time on the timer also goes down, leading to a faster, more hectic and frantic round. Eliminated players like to stick around because it's fun to watch the remaining players as they read out the cards in a panic. <laughs> so what makes this game really fun to play are the statements you have to read on the cards. All 70 cards have unique potato-related dad jokes and puns that are sure to make some people laugh, even the reader, all while trying to frantically get Bud away from you before the timer goes off. Here are some examples of cards. Whoa, those hash browns are t they are, are totally shredded. Go ask them how they work out. Bud moves left three spaces. <laughs> Choose your paths widely, Bud. There's a fork in the road ahead. Bud moves right four spaces. <laughs> A special screening of the Silence of the Yams is played over there. You should go see it. But moves left four spaces. 
Bud says, I only have eyes for you. I don't want to go anywhere else right now. So Bud stays with you. You have to draw another card. <laughs> the cards have different types of movements for Bud, where Bud goes to the right of the player, to the left, all the way around, uh, stays with the player, can get passed to a chosen player, or even tossed to any player. Because of this, you never know if you're going to be the next player with Bud until he finally shows up. <laughs> Then it's your turn to have to tell him to go away. And that's our game. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, I enjoyed how much Rachel enjoyed that. So. I might have enjoyed that. <laughs> <laughs> so we have 70 unique bad dad jokes and bad potato puns. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> I have I have a special affinity for puns. I, they're all all in my games. I mean, like my my bad guys are named Ginger Vitus and Nick OT. And I mean, like this is something that I would totally get behind if not play if I couldn't make it. But man, um, I also adored how excited you guys are like how we're you so guys excited to be here <laughs> have a fantastic presentation i was excited and because you guys were excited and your delivery was on point i'm mad at you debbie because i was really excited to be mean <laughs> and this is not working for me this is way too, way too easy to be nice when it was such awesome pitches <laughs> any questions <laughs> So, um, so basically, uh, uh, everybody gets their card. Do you do you see your card before you get the potato? So when uh, at the maybe. beginning of the game, uh, someone has Bud, and they have to draw a card from uh, a po uh, one of the decks somewhere. If it's a big group, you can split up a the couple deck. of different decks. Yeah, or but, uh, but yeah, you don't see the card until someone gets it, and then it gets discarded after they read it. Yeah, but we play test. I'm sorry. I was just gonna say, Bud this Bud's an actual plushie, right? Is that? Um, is? Actually, he's a um, stress ball. Ooh, okay. Ooh, I need yeah. one of those. Yeah. <laughs> I might just keep Spud and just lose. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but we play tested this with a group of 20 players, and we did not run, out, run out of cards card. through the, all, the entire game. And uh, do, is there things moving enough that uh, that was a large group like that? People are feeling engaged. Um, oh, yes. Everybody's so. laughing at the other people as they try to read the card because there is a timer set. And yeah. everybody has a timer on their phone. Yeah. So no timer needed for the game. Yeah. And, the only uh, components are the... Potato this. and the cards. Yeah. Um, yeah. Basically, people are in a panic, and they tend to not be able to read correctly yeah. when they're yeah. in a panic, which is great. You can totally make fun and of your friends. You don't know how much time is left. It, you, you have to hide the right. timer. So that, because of that, people are constantly not sure if in they have enough time. In that state of panic. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and when they script the read, do they have to start over? Do people like call them on it and they start over? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And one thing, you have it listed as 2 to 20. Have you guys tested all the way to 20? We yes. have. Yeah. It, wow. Actually, and we didn't even run out of cards. Uh, Which was 20, amazing. So theoretically, we could go up to 25 players, yeah. really. It depends on the group and, yeah. you know, how, how they uh, are able to play. So I mean, this would be the next two rooms in a boom of some sort, you know. For <laughs> yeah. Okay. It could also be a mint tin game if you make Bud the tin. And then the cards are in the tin. And then Bud the tin is passed around. Just thinking. <laughs> Might get somebody injured when you throw the tin, though. I don't know. Yeah, they might get hurt. We yeah. probably, you probably you would wouldn't probably have remove toss. the tossing cards out yeah. of the tin game. Yeah. I love I love everyone trying to figure out how to fit my stuff in the tin. <laughs> <laughs> trying to help it out. All right, the time's up. Any final comments? Any more feedback from everyone? Oh, Marcus in the uh, comments is asking how long a round is. Uh, so it uh, with nine plus players, uh, it's uh, 90, 90 seconds. seconds. And then with eight players, it's 80. And it keeps going down like that. And, and then when it's two players, it's actually 30, 30 seconds, seconds. Because 20 seconds isn't enough time to go through a couple cards. Yeah. Uh, and so because of that, it's two to three players is 30 seconds. And it, every type of player gets another 10 seconds all the way up to 90 seconds. 
So it actually keeps going really fast and it's never too long. So people right. are still always the, constantly worried. The worry. game that we played with 20 players lasted 15 and a half minutes. Yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah, it's a quick game. Yeah. It's a good opener. Okay, great. Awesome. Okay. Well, thanks for having us. I want to play it. I buy it category, so that's you know it's a good sign. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad to hear it. Yeah. yeah. All right, great. So thank you very much. I'm yeah. gonna move on to our next designer, who is uh Mike Sutton. So Mike, hi Mike, how are you? Uh he'll be presenting his game Gateway to the Stars. It's a deck building space exploration game. I think we have at least, I know one person that makes space deck building games here. Um, he's been playing modern board games for four years and always very interested in learning about a lot of different types of mechanics. He, Mike is a photographer by trade and uh, he and his wife run a photography studio out of their home in Knoxville, Tennessee. I have always wanted to go to Tennessee and I have not made it there yet. We recently just moved here from Seattle actually. Ah. I'd love to hear about it, but you're you're on a timer that I'm about to start, so I'll let you focus on your game. All right. Well, Rachel, I think you're going to get your wish here, because not only do I not have puns, but it won't fit in a tin either. Uh, all right. So, I'm out. I'm <laughs> out. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Mike, and board games are one of my favorite things in the world. Uh, I was an avid video gamer until I was introduced to board games at an Extra Life charity event a few years ago uh, with Star Realms, funny enough. Uh, which prompted me to transition away from video games and set me headfirst into the tabletop world. Uh, I've always been interested in science fiction, and after playing a ton of space games, that uh, nothing that I played really hit all the key elements that I was looking for. Uh, from this, Gateway to the Stars was born. Gateway to the Stars is a deck-building, light to mid-weight 4X space game uh, with primary focuses on exploration and adaptation. Players use their deck of cards improved uh, by the market and by other means to explore new areas of space and gain renown. Renown is renown. a victory point system in the game, but it's also the currency. Players will have to spend renown to upgrade their decks. Uh, in the world of Gateway to the Stars, players are controlling corporations who are racing to become the most popular option to provide space travel for humanity. Completing great feats such as discovering inhabitable planets, mining asteroids, defeating pirates and other threats, uh, will earn players renown and likewise corporations having ships destroyed investing in themselves and other things that aren't in the immediate interest of earth will lose them renown uh, the game takes place over three eras with each round representing a new generation players will be drawing tiles from the current era deck and exploring outward from the central tile which is a space station called the gateway after a certain amount of generations the game moves on to the next era uh, at the beginning of the game Newly explored space will be relatively safe, but as the game goes on and players move further from Earth, increasingly dangerous situations await. With an event deck that has multiple cards corresponding with each newly explored tile, the game unfolds in a narrative way that feels natural while playing. These cards will usually have either a decision for the player to make or a dice test with different rewards and consequences. With multiple ways to earn renown, I'm always interested in watching playtesters navigate the game. I'm constantly seeing strategies that I never thought of uh, and I love that the game allows players to really tailor it to how they want to play. Historically, games like this tend to have a relatively high barrier of entry, whether that's uh, whether it's a, comp a complexity issue or a length of game issue. They're just really difficult for most people to get to the table with any sort of frequency. So this one, supporting two to four players and an average game time of about 30 minutes per player, uh, Gateway to the Stars alleviates both of those pain points for me. Uh, I've dabbled in game design for a couple of years, but this is the first one that I made that I really feel uh, has some marketability. Uh, and I'm really excited for the potential of it. And I hope you guys are as well. So thank you for, for listening to that. I'd love to take questions. I do have a couple of screenshots that uh, that I can share as well um, that uh, I could either do now or as you guys are asking questions. If you want to do them now and people can ask their questions, if you want to sure. share them now, I'll highlight them while people ask their questions. So I guess uh, um, uh, take me through a take me through my turn. Like so, it's my turn. What am I doing? Okay, so on your turn, you have basically four phases. Uh, the first phase is resolve threats. There's a threat deck um, for the second and third eras. You don't do one in the first era. Uh, that you will draw a card and 
uh, resolve what is on the threat deck. Sometimes it's a dice test. Sometimes there, there may be no threat. Um, they're always uh, a risk reward. Um, basically, you can you can choose to opt out of doing the threat, but you'll lose renown for doing so, uh, or you can follow it through and potentially either gain or lose based on what uh, based on what happens. So there's the threat phase, uh, the market phase, where you can purchase new cards from the market. Uh, do I purchase them? What do I use? You use renown, so you use basically your victory points to purchase. Card. Card. Okay. Yep, to purchase uh, to purchase cards. Um, so there's the market phase, and then there's the explore phase, and this is kind of the meat of the game, uh, where you will be uh, using your deck to move and explore, which would be pulling tiles from the top of the current era, and putting them adjacent to a space that you're on to expand the map. Um, and on those tiles will be uh, will be basically a message saying, you know, look at uh, draw card X from the event deck, and you'll you'll resolve that. And I've got a couple of screenshots of that that uh, that I can share. Um, and then the last one is the combat phase. So if you and another player end up on the same space, uh, then you'll you'll do combat, which is very simple dice rolls. Um, so I'll tap a little uh, like a spaceship or something that I'm picking up and physically moving. If I want to explore an area, I put a tile down and I I move my piece to that location. If I yep. want to go to an existing location to get the benefit there, I can do that too. Yes, no. There are some locations uh, that are existing that give you a benefit. Um, there are uh, wormhole tiles here. Actually, let me let me bring bring one of these up again really quick. Um, yeah, and we have a, about a little less than oh, yeah, a minute. Sorry, a little less than a minute so left. I've, okay. got some, I've got some mean old feedback. Oh yes. Good, good. I was, good. I'm, I'm glad you. I'm ready. I'm ready. He told me he told me I wasn't gonna like him, so I got I got my game face on, and I'm I'm ready to not like it. Okay, so <laughs> here is my advice: when you come to a pitch, come with uh, I need to know components. I want to know like I I have had no idea what you were talking about most of the time. Okay. Um, I only knew what I was uh, presented with with the cell sheet, uh, and that's just what was in front of me. If you had stuff that you could have been showing during, it would have been good. Um, I, the fishing game, they they went ahead and showed what uh, other stuff at the same time as their explanation. Um, I uh, when you said that you were moving things uh, a spaceship to another another. Uh, card. I didn't even realize there was spaceships in the game. I thought, you know, we were talking Star Realms. It is all dice. Or, sorry, all dice. <laughs> all cards. Uh, and, I mean, I just am totally confused right now, like, uh, where all of that went. Um, I, I would say definitely test out your pitch before uh, you try and, and do that again. And uh, I, I'm sure that it I like that um, you've got some really cool cards uh, that I can see now here. But um, yeah, you doing need it while I was pitching thing. would have been a lot better. Yeah, yeah you, need a, you need a read. Picture, like, see, actually seeing the board where it's like, oh, okay, you put cards out and you go to them, and so yeah. it's different every time. Like, yeah, there's your renown, have... there's your victory points. Like, what? Yep, what? yep. Yeah. I was going to, and then I decided that it was going to be a lot for me to do by myself and so yeah, yeah. i decided it's just yeah so it's tricky your game this is this is what i was talking about earlier and the thing your game has a lot of meat there's a lot going on and that can that's awesome like i tend to make games like that uh personally but um they're difficult to condense down and pitch quickly and you have to be able to pitch quickly because people are busy you might catch them in like the literal elevator pitch you know yeah. uh, uh so um basically getting an idea of what you're doing and how you're doing it and conveying it, you know, conveying it quickly and clearly. Um, I have, I think I have a, a, a general sense at this point, but I had to sort of, you know, uh, pull, you know, pull that, uh, uh, that information out. Um, so uh, it's the kind of thing where I have to, this seems like it's probably my style of game, but I, I don't have a great sense of it. I have to like sit down with it and, you know, and, and play through it. But uh, I like the idea of exploring space with cards and, oh, we're exploring a new sector. So you have a card or a tile or whatever, and you're literally putting that down on the table and exploring space. That's cool. Combining that with like a deck building style element where you've got, you know, stuff that you're, you're improving your capabilities with. That's cool too. But I, I didn't catch all that with the pitch. 
I will or tell like, you. The fun part is like, uh, like there's a lot of stuff going on, but I don't know what would what's fun and different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I think one of the four um, X games are, I think, a, a sort of a, a niche type of game in the first place. Is um, this a four X? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't think I got that from the pitch. Like, um, I got I it from know. the sell sheet, but the sell sheet was not. Yeah, so. Okay. All right. Well, we're, we're, we need to move on unless anyone, if you guys have any quick comments from the publisher, okay. no more questions for him right now. Thank you. I appreciate it, guys. This was so my first question. I appreciate all the feedback. I, I do. I just want to say. That that I knew it was going south when after about ten seconds of him reading his script, all of the rest of the people on the screen were like looking and checking their phones, and somebody was like clicking over here, and I'm like, dude, come on. Oh yeah, like at some point I tried to like look at the cell sheet because I was like, I'm I'm getting lost here, so I need I the cell sheet to like. I know get me I back had it up here, and I was like trying, I was I was trying, but. So you, you're going to do it better next time. You got Thank this. You. Thank well, you. I appreciate Mike, it, guys. I had the sheet up, and I was following what you were saying. So well, I <laughs> think you can get it there. But I had already read the cell sheet, so I, okay. so I kind of was following what you were saying looking down at the sheet. Okay. Well, thanks, guys. This was my first pitch, so I appreciate all the feedback. Great. Thank you. Thanks so much. Mwah. So I'm not just let's just chat for a minute before we bring on. We just have one more designer left. We've actually been pretty good at staying on time. We're just four minutes over and we have one more designer. Um, I think Can it's all congratulate Rachel for finally. Yes, yes. Thank you for being the movie. We needed that. I, I Carla got out, in on it a bit. Shout out to Mike very quickly. I know how tough it is to do your first pitch. So you, you know, like uh, I know we had lots of sort of like critical feedback, but, you know, really props for coming on. That's good. I mean, honestly, I could tell that he was nervous, but the fact that he was here, he has already gone past the 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 first obstacle. So well done for showing up. Well, and for taking feedback well, because that's always something I look for yeah. when like I give feedback during a pitch. Like if they actually care about it, then that is so much better than not like taking it well or responding poorly. Yeah, because they have to be able to listen to it if you're going to develop the game. You know, it's so hard for people to let go of their, their babies. Yeah. And we have a general feedback before we go to the last designer you guys have for people coming to do these. We have another event at NunPub, which is called Feedback Frenzy. I point, pay, pasted a link in the comments if designers wanted to submit to be part of that one. But does anyone have any other general feedback after seeing all these pitches? I think online pitches, like you have to be really good at having like a second camera and knowing like what you're going to show on it and when like practicing not only the pitch and you're talking but like showing it on camera yeah well to be fair i did recommend to people that they just talk since we had a very short window of time but if they wanted to they could use a second camera they could um s send a sell sheet ahead of time so for the people watching we did have sell sheets um for the games that they emailed to us ahead of time so if people had time they could take a look at them and you know be a little more prepared but most of them didn't provide any additional information than what was covered in their presentations well and they can share their screen so that way the yeah. nervousness they're not on camera so much but we can hear them and they're showing off their products so that might even be a Maybe yeah, I think next piece, time yeah. I would definitely encourage people to do that because I think it was helpful. I mean, it depends on what you have for things to show, but I think the share screen is nice because it does, then that becomes the main focus. And if you're nervous, that could be a good thing. Oh, and, and Mike, if you want to practice, look me up. Just send me yeah. send me a PM and I will, I am way nicer. I'm just, just hamming it up. No worries. <laughs> I also want to emphasize like, if you catch me at a show, I'm busy. Mm -hmm. And the first thing I need to know is number of players, play time and age. Like the I, first thing I need to know is yeah. where would this fit in my product line? And am I looking for something like that? Mm -hmm. so getting me just oriented on like what the game is about is like the first thing. Yeah, like especially the audience. Cause like with some of these pitches, like I had to like figure out it was, it was for like families or kids and stuff. But like knowing that like up front, like mm -hmm. um, there was one pitch, I think the fish one that was, uh, they brought up like strategic, but then like it's a family game, which I see as different categories as family. And then there's strategic, which are for like adults. Right. So. All right. All right. 
So we'll Last move one. on. And if anyone has any questions in general for the panel, if people can stay for a couple of minutes at the end, we'll take them. But I can't guarantee because we're already over time. That's why I wanted to have get some general chat before we moved on to Chris. So Chris Baki is a digital nomad. He's originally from the Chicago area. He helps run the virtual play testing Discord group. So uh, Chris, if you want to post a link afterwards or you know now in, in the chat so people know about that Discord group, that would be great because I think a lot of people are looking for virtual play testing right now. Um, he'll be presenting a game called Secret Recipe. I like to cook, so I'm looking forward to hearing about this one. I do not like to cook. I'm ready to shred it. Hi, guys. Hey. How are Good you? To see you all. I'm doing great. I've had a great time watching these various pitches, and I do want to give a shout out to Fertessa and Mondo. I was just playing mansplaining, uh, playtesting that game with them last night and had a blast playing that game. I really want to see that published, and I can't wait to uh, mansplain some stuff to uh, some other gamers. Great. We, we also want to play it. Well, yeah. we didn't get to play it, but we want to. So if they're looking for more play testers, let me, I'm going to reset your timer so you can still have your whole time. Sure, no problem. I've got uh, a screen share going on here. So feel free to switch over to that. Okay. All right. So this is Secret Recipe. This is a logic and deduction game for two to six players, uh, aiming for age eight and up. Uh, it takes about 30 minutes to play. Uh, this is, uh, yeah, so you're trying to find the secret recipe. Players are all siblings. You're all at Grandma's house. She's made a huge batch of her world-famous chili, and naturally, you all want to figure out her secret recipe. She said that the clues are all around you, but she'll give it, the recipe to the first person who can figure out which ingredients she uses. So you all race to the kitchen for clues. Uh, each person starts with a few clues in front of them. Uh, the... Game works a little bit differently in Tabletop Simulator versus the real world version, but the idea is the same. You have a secret player board uh, in this uh, in the shielded area. You start the game with some cards in your hand that only uh, you will know what they are, and kind of like Clue, you start with uh, one card of each taste. I'm just scroll up here. So this is the secret recipe right here. We have one savory ingredient, one secret ingredient, one spicy, one strong, one sweet. This is what you're trying to figure out, and you're doing this by the process of deduction, uh, process of elimination. So you start with a few uh, ingredients that you already know. You can mark those with red cubes to say, I have seen them, therefore they are not uh, in the secret recipe. When you're playing on your turn, you'll just move your pawn to uh, from one space to another, and then either take the card on it or take the action on it. So for example, I might go to the oven here, and the oven here says, ask a player a question with a number for an answer. So I might want to learn. Uh, uh, basically, this is your chance to be a little bit clever about learning information without giving or revealing any information of your own. So uh, I might want to ask this person, the orange player up here, because I know they have two strong cards, but I don't know what they are. So I might ask them a question that helps me understand what they have in their hand without them revealing anything. Uh, if I went to the dining room table, I might make a claim about two ingredients of the same type. And this works a little bit like Clue in that I might say, oh, I think grandma used um, uh, jalapenos or bell peppers. And the first person to show me that, one of those cards, gets to look at one of my cards. So I learned some information they learn some information. Um, when you think you know what one of the ingredients are, you may uh, you may make a guess on your turn. Uh, you will so if I if I think I know what the spicy ingredient is right here, I would take one of these cards. I would score four points if I'm right or three points if I'm wrong. No one else will know whether I was right or wrong because I'm only going to secretly peek at this card. So I might guess that the spicy ingredient is sausage, and then I peek at this, and keep. I would, I would want to keep a poker face while doing that, but I'm going to move this card into my secret area behind my shield so that I know that I scored some points or didn't score some points. Uh, when someone thinks they know all of the answers, they will announce that they know it, and if anyone can disprove that, uh, they will just say incorrect or no, 
and then uh, take a point. If they get them all right, they'll score some points for every card they have not seen. You're, I just want to interrupt. You're over your time, so I don't know if you can, if you want to add that's anything. All really quick. That okay. is all I've got. Thanks. Dessert. Yeah. Dessert. <laughs> yeah. Well, good dessert are usually chocolate cakes, maybe a cheesecake to help kind of cool the spicy part down. Mmm, hungry. So, um, uh, <laughs> this may be, a, this may be a, me personally biased, but like when that board came out, I was immediately intimidated and like, ooh, this looks, this looks hard. Um, me too. So I don't, you know, like, um, and that may be a just me thing, but that I sort of had a negative reaction to seeing the board. I was like, oh my God, there's lots of squares. There's lots of things. I'm you know, like, this is going to be, my brain went, this is going to be hard, uh, which is not yeah. where my brain to go when I see a game board come out. So. Yeah. And that's mainly how the tabletop simulator has it laid out. In the real world, you'd have the cards laid out, but you'd have each sort of distinct area. You would not see the five big blocks um, everyone else has. You would just have, here's one I prepared earlier. Uh, you just have a board like this, and it's mm -hmm. basically just a cardboard sort of shield. So as you're, so in the real world version, you just take it and you write, uh, write something on your uh, like X's or O's or what what. Can you show that again? I'm just zoomed in on you. Sure. So uh, this is this is the real world board. It's basically the same thing, but the idea here is you've got this just a cardboard shield, and you would um, circle a circle a thing or X a thing. Uh, as you learn information, basically. Um, so the reason the colored uh, pieces are there are because people at the top simulator, that's how they do like private mm -hmm. information. Mm -hmm. So I would recommend spending, finding somebody who's good at art and graphics to, uh, to try and make some pretty around that board. When I look at that board, I see a spreadsheet and that makes my brain think work and not fun. Um, if there were like artwork or whatever uh, that was pretty and whimsical or something surrounding the board or something, I'm not exactly sure it, what I would do, but I want I want the I want that component to make the player think fun as opposed to mm -hmm. making them think work. Um, so that's mm -hmm. uh, okay. So that, we're, that's not talking, we're not talking like commissioned art. We're talking about you know just I of course like public domain art and so on. Art and and sure. yeah, yeah, whatever whatever that makes us look at it as not just black and white. This is something I can think through and helps our brains connect on in, in the areas. Mm -hmm. And I want to add a little bit to the <clears throat> pit that you did drove, like jumped into the mechanics really quickly. And for me personally, I'm not ready for mechanics at all to mm -hmm. begin with. I'm more about what's the hook, what's the theme. Like, a, you know, you, you went into kind of like a strategic thing that you might say so that other people don't get the information. And, and it's really hard to envision that on a, like a quick pitch. So mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not a great hook for me personally, at least. Right. Yeah, I th think the pitch you gave was more like, oh, okay, we already know what's fun and we want to like know how to play the game. Yeah. But we needed that, like what is fun and interesting and different and then into the mechanics. Yeah. Like yeah. It seems like you yeah. went full demo and um, uh, somebody has, has, uh, explained to me before if you think that there's one last thing you want to say don't say it like <laughs> you, you, you just stop you're like oh and i want to tell them one last no just stop <laughs> yeah so one of the one of the things that is fun about it is asking questions making claims you're allowed to be deceptive with the the questions you ask and the claims you make but you must be 100% truthful with your answers. So you might uh, make a claim uh, about two ingredients you think are in there, but you actually have one of them in your hand. So you know someone else has it, or if they don't, maybe that's the one that's in the mm -hmm. recipe. So you get a chance to be deceptive in a deduction game. You don't get to do that very often. How long is the gameplay? About oh, three minutes. That's unique. Okay. I like that it's a theme that's more approachable and more practical to uh, the general audience versus something that is like a specific, you know, uh, geekery or, you know, yeah. uh, that type thing. So I think that that's really cool because that's something that uh, non-gamers are going to find um, less intimidating. 
Yeah, and it is a it is a family friendly theme. Uh, I'm aiming for a gateway or gateway plus uh, style game. Uh, it, I do have with a lot of respect to Clue and Sleuth, which I absolutely love. Uh, sometimes those games can get rather abstract. Uh, the Clue has a lot of randomness to it, and I, I love the deduction in those games. And I'm hoping to make that deduction element uh, more approachable. Um, while giving giving some room for luck and some interim scoring. You don't just have one big climactic reveal at the end. You have scoring as you play. At some point, I want to play this prototype because Clue is my absolute <laughs> top classic cardboard, for sure. Like, it's yeah. my favorite. Yeah, I'm also interested I, I, in just seeing more about it. But I also, like Rob, thought it was looked really complicated. I'm wondering if people shouldn't use Tabletop Simulator, depending on their theme and the, the weight of the game. Because um, pretty much whenever anyone drops me into Tabletop Simulator, it usually looks more complicated than it is in real life. Yeah, I've actually actually debated uh, like opening up on on just the player board so you can kind of see the one thing that you're going to be writing on or manipulating as you play, and then yeah. kind of zooming out to uh, some of the other areas. Honestly, I I'm not sure if there's a, a, a better uh, preferred solution there, but the idea is that you can start from a zoomed out perspective or and then zoom in a little bit or vice versa. But it's not a complex game I can teach you in five minutes. All right. Chris, uh, what was more compelling to me was when all the boards are gone and you were talking about the game afterwards. That was yeah. a lot more compelling to me than than when you were talking about the mechanics. Okay. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. So I don't see any questions. I don't know if anyone had any questions for the audience, but it looks like we're like way over. So. I think it's a good time to wrap up. Rob had to step away for a minute. Um, does anyone have any final words they would like to share with aspiring game designers? Um, there was one question about how to pitch a, a strategic game in a short period mm -hmm. of time. Yeah, I would. Uh, I would not go into the details. Like one of the of the mechanics, uh, theme is important. Target market weight, and then. Normally, if you've got a heavy game, you're you're going to a niche audience that's that understand that's played a lot of games, and so you're going to want a, a hook that could be a mechanical hook, like, oh, it's a legacy game, except it's um, also a social deduction game, or you know, like some high level hook where you're like, oh, cool, I haven't seen a game like that, you know. So if you're doing a heavy strategy, you're often going to a market where people are really familiar with what's come out before. Yeah, like, well, for any pitch, like, tell me what's cool, unique, different. Like, why Why do I want to play it? Why is it fun? Yeah. Rachel, any final words? I definitely am just like, tell me the overview. Tell me what I'm going to be making. Like, I need to know components. I want to know the stats. I want, like, tell me a sell sheet to start. And then if I have more questions, then start to tell me this, the rest. And again, don't keep going until I stop you. Take a breath. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think I love to see a pitch and hear about a game. We're just doing final thoughts, Rob, yeah. on any feedback for designers. I really love it when I see, so we've done some speed dating events. So for designers who aren't familiar with that, that's when uh, you go into a room and there's a lot of designers and they each have their own table and you go from you have you spend I don't know how long it is but it's a couple of minutes and then they ring a bell or tell you move on to the next one you move on to the next one and you you know basically get a really quick pitch and then you move on to the next one and I love it when I can't wait to talk to them again to hear more I don't like it when they go into a demo and it's really common that someone goes way into the weeds and they're also not making eye contact they're not noticing that you know you're looking down or you're looking like, whoa, this is way too much. So I think it's also important to watch people's faces and body language when you're pitching to them. Yes, um, yes. And, you know, because a lot, I will say that a lot of designers do, do go way into the details, like right out of the gate. And it's like, whoa, you know, and just talking about, like, I guess Carla said, what's cool, what's fun, what, why would I be excited? And that's why I wanted to do this session, because I wanted people to practice the sort of just talking about your game. Um, but as people said, for many games, it is helpful to have visual cues as well. And absolutely, yeah. I dropped stuff in there. Um, I dropped my Discord link in there. 
very serious. If anybody would like to touch base with me, I would be happy to give them tips and, and let them practice. I, I want you to be successful. And so just look me up. Uh, I mean, same with me. We do um, sell sheet, like uh, where I go through sell sheets and tell people like what my thoughts are and stuff. And we're planning to do that with pitches in my Discord. So uh, there's a lot of game designery stuff for that. Yeah, I highly recommend that. Rob, do you, do you have anything? Yeah, just I mean, uh, I think it's been said before, but basically, uh, I want to know what's fun about what you. Know, so tell me where the fun is. And give me a general sense of what I'm doing, um, and, you know, and that's uh, um, without going, in, you know, into the weeds. Um, so, uh, um, you know, keep it quick, keep it understandable. And if you're uh, if you're gonna, it, um, we know that designers are not game designers are not graphic designers or artists, but basically, if you can, um, you know, if you can if you can make your components look fun, uh, even though, and and you can let me know, hey, this is public domain stuff or these are you know this is you know our artwork that you could have if you want you know those are good things for me to know but basically the the more the play the person you're pitching to can imagine what the final product is going to look like the better um so uh um you know having you know uh having a little bit of that in there you know definitely helps and rob you missed a question while you're away uh strategy games you know heavier games do you have any feedback on best ways to specifically for those types of games yeah that, i as i said those are really Same. uh you know those are really tough to uh you know tougher mm -hmm. to pitch um the you know like a, a kids game or a party game you know you got a big leg up when you're doing your pitch because you know you might be able to do a full turn and you know people understand exactly what's going on uh uh in the game so i think um you know uh uh giving me a sense of what type of decisions I'm going to be making, what's, you know, mm -hmm. what's going on. Um, and you know, what, uh, uh, what, you know, what are my moves? What am I doing? Uh, and, and why is it fun? Um, I think, uh, um, I think helps a lot. And I think that the final takeaway of this entire thing should be that Dominic totally could have been on deadliest catch. Just say that is the coolest <laughs> bit of trivia I learned today. <laughs> So Rachel, I knew some of those guys. We would deliver our fish to them <laughs> oh, cool. in the winter, and then they'd come and work in our industry in the summer. Ah, yeah. I'm fangirling all over this. <laughs> all right. I'm sure we have lots more we could talk about, but it's been quite some time. Thank you, everyone on the panel for, I know it's, it can be a lot to live stream for this length of time. I appreciate it. And I know the designers appreciate it. And like I said, there's a link if people want to submit for the next one that's going to happen at NunPub. Thanks for watching. And it will be archived. It'll be available on the White Wizard Games Twitch channel, which I posted in the comments and on our YouTube channel. So don't worry if you didn't see the whole thing. You can go back and, you know, watch Rachel be super nice to all the designers. Except Very nice. <laughs> except for poor Mike. We, you know, we, the designers did a fantastic job. So thank you to all the designers as well. I know it takes guts, a lot of guts to get up in front, especially streaming uh, like this and, you know, being on recorded video. So thank you very much. And thank you, Debbie, for putting this on. This was fun. Yes. Bye, guys.